Exodus chapter 2, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Exodus chapter 2, amen. Exodus, the second chapter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody knows what today is. Hallmark made sure of it. Amen. And as much as we honor our mothers, we honor the one who gave mothers life, Jesus. Amen. Thank God for him. You know, my mother was, uh, I can't prove I was the favorite. You can't disprove it. But I always felt like, you know, because she would save me up a bag of potato chips on a Wednesday night while I watched the wife 5 and everybody else went to bed, that evidently I was the favorite. Amen. Some moms will do that. You know, she, she, back in the day, you could buy chips and come in a double bag. You remember that? Amen. So she'd buy a double bag, and Sandy and Jim always thought that life was just about one bag, but she always took a bag and hid it up in the cabinet. One da 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 came on on Wednesday night, Hawaii Five O. Amen. I'd I'd get to stay up late and eat potato chips, and to this day, that's the reason why I'm as big as I am. Yeah. Amen. My mama started all that right there because I am a potato. I, I mean, I will. I, I let me just be honest. With you. I'm on lean cuisine right now. I'm doing whatever I can to kind of get leaner because I'm, I'm around Joseph and David and, other, and Maris who, who, who have this ability to lose weight. Of course, they're 30 years younger than me, but still, they, they really knocked it down. So I thought, I'm going on Lean Cuisine, so I've been on it for a week. But every night, about 9 o'clock, I get that itch. And I got to pull that Tommy couple bags, a bag of potatoes, and I, and I, and I uh, watch myself. I just get me a handful and then another handful. And then, then I put them up, you know, save them for later. But it's just a, my mama started all that. You know why? Because she loved me. Hallelujah. The devil never reckons a man to be lost so long as his has a good mother alive. Charles Spurgeon said that. So, Mom, thank you for that. Hallelujah. Exodus chapter 2. If I went back and I don't have time to read chapter 1 to you, but you, you can look at it later. But I'm going to tell you, chapter 1 has to do with slavery that the Israelites were slaves to the Egyptians. And at this time, it's 320 years. For 320 years, they have been slaves. See, that's a generation I don't understand. You know, I just... <laughs> uh, we jacked our cars up. My dad didn't understand that either. That one right there, uh-uh. Okay. Okay. 320 years at this point. The Israelites growing in numbers threatened the Egyptians. The Egyptians were so concerned that the Israelites were having babies. And they multiplied, they multiplied, that Pharaoh put an edict in. He's one of the pharaohs. They were pharaoh, many pharaohs. And a pharaoh of Egypt put an edict in that all male babies would be cast into the Nile River. Now, I want you to think about that just a little bit as we move through this day where even Roe v. Wade could actually get overturned after 50 years. Amen. But the issue here was a law. Everybody say a law. So this law, this edict went in that every time a mother gave birth to a son, they would take the baby. The midwives, the Egyptian midwives would get there, and they would take the baby and throw it into the river Nile, of course, which was um, populated with crocodiles. So the crocodiles would eat the little babies. All the little girls, they would live. Amen. So now we find Exodus chapter 1, chapter 2. Are you comfortable? Verse 1. I've been nice to you the last week or two. Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. Now, a man of the house of Levi. Remember, the word Levi, the, Levitic, uh, the Levites, that's your praisers. That's the, the leader of the priesthood, if you will. So now, a man by the, uh, the house of Levi named, uh, married a Levite woman. Now, I'm going to go ahead and give you their names. His name was Amram. Her name was Jochebed. Everybody say Jochebed. I like to say it. Say Jochebed. That's mama there, man, Jochebed. She became pregnant and gave birth uh, to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months, 90 days, kept him quiet. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. When she placed the child in it, she put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. I can see Jochebed, even with her tears, putting tar into that little ark that she made. And there's so many types here 
that I see. This is like a type of the ark. It's a, it's a type of refuge. It's a type of uh, escape, if you would. And she's making this basket. knowing she's going to put this little three-month-old baby in there. She placed a child in it among the reeds along what? The bank of the Nile. His sister, Moses' sister, her name was Miriam, stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. When Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it, which would be another Hebrew. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. Now, not to take away from this, but that dog that showed up at my house, I have felt sorry for her, and now we are foster parents. Okay, I'm just going just to tell you that right now. So, and so don't ask for her because I, I ain't giving her up. <laughs> His sister stood at a distance. Here we go. She, when Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her tenders were walking along the riverbank, she saw the basket. She opened it up and saw the baby. He's crying. She felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. And his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the, he, uh, one of the, let me find where I went, one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you. Now, let, let me just keep you understanding here. It's Miriam that's saying to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Do you remember a few uh, months ago I preached to you about providence? When God exposes his hand, when you didn't see it fixing that, this is providence. This is Moses' big sister who was working with Pharaoh's daughter that says, you want me to go find somebody because many of the women had milk because their babies had been cast into the river. So she said, let me go find somebody to nurse that baby. Guess who she found? She found the mother of Moses, Jochebed. Oh, can you imagine the thrill in the heart of Jochebed when Marion went running into the house and said, guess what, mama? Mama go, what? With tears in her eyes. We have found mm, that little boy. Matter of fact, it was Pharaoh's daughter that named him Moses. We don't know what she called him. She might have called him kid, chubby. Amen. Ain't no tell. I'm, I'm sorry, that's not politically correct no more. Amen. Uh, big boy. In the river. Mama, would you like another chance with that baby? Oh, bring me that boy. So she brings Moses. Verse 8, yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. Cha-ching. You mean, you going to, I get my baby back, and you going to pay me? I give my baby back, baby back, baby back. Give my baby back, baby back, baby back. Oh, this is incredible. So the woman took the baby, nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Father, I thank you for the word of God. Touch every heart in the house, your presence. Oh, Lord, is so needed here to touch our own hearts. We thank you for every joy, every kindness, every blessing, Lord, of being a parent, particularly mothers on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Maybe see you. Moses, man, what a great man. He was a giver of the law. His name he's drawn out means rescued. Amen. He was the rescued one. And later the Egyptian tradition would have been, amen, drawn out by God. Amen. So he was a prince. He was the prince of Egypt. Amen. He was an adopted child there, a man of faith. Hebrews 11 tells us that. He was a man of miracles, the ten plagues, the part. I mean, Moses, ten plagues, the Red Sea parted. Amen. Uh, the, the, the rock he struck and the water came out from the well, He spoke first and the water came out, struck it second. And the, the Bible gives this peculiar thing about Moses. And I, this is one of those hard things to grab hold of, wrap your mind around. But in the very beginning of time, amen, this is one of the oldest books in the Bible, we read about about Moses who knew there was a Christ. Are you hearing me? Because when he struck the rock, God rebuked him because that Christ was rock, well, that rock was Christ. And later on, we'll read about Hebrews 11. We'll read it and realize that he understood. I, and, and I don't know, was it a, a, when he talked to the bush, 
Did the bush begin to reveal himself more as the son of God? But something had, Moses knew something, that there was more than just God himself, that there was a, a, a figure, if you would, that's a terrible word to use there, but the son of God was manifested in his life. He was a man of miracles. He was a great leader, called the meekest man on the earth. Amen. He was a prophet. And, and by the way, speaking of being the meekest man, you know as I do, if you hold a stick up and water's part, it would be hard not to get a little arrogant. Come on, can I get an amen? Amen. And I can take that stick and whip it out any time, and next thing you know, snakes are after you. Don't jack with me, boy. Amen. I'm telling you, but he was meek. He was, he was humble about it. Amen. Before he was all that, though, he was a thought in the heart of God. He was a fetus in the womb of his mother. He was an infant in the hands of a protector. He was a child under the guidance of a visionary. He was potentially a lost child in the land of idolatry and Egyptian influence. But he had a mama. Everybody say mama. mama. Named Jochebed. I just like her name, man. She loved life. She was a woman of faith. She trusted God to watch over Moses. I, I don't know what she knew, but when she put that baby in that, she didn't throw him in, but at three months of age, she put him there and had to believe God for the best, and it happened. She raised three very successful kids. She raised up Miriam, this young daughter that was close enough to Pharaoh his daughter, amen, to go and get Moses. Miriam was a singer. She was a praiser. She loved a tambourine. Mm. She raised up a boy named Aaron. Aaron was a boy. He was head over the Levites. He was a praiser. He was a worshiper. And then she brought in this youngest one, Moses, giver of the law. She had several traits. First, she handed down a heritage. A man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman. Jochebed and her husband, Amram, were Levites, those who offered up praise. They had a spiritual heritage. In other words, for 320 years there in slavery, they kept alive. And this is so important. We're one generation from losing everything gospel-wise. Amen. If you don't share it with your kids and your grandkids and make connections with them and talk to them and pray with them at night, amen, and do things for them and help them understand when we're all gone, what's going to happen to the next generation? So for 320 years, they kept alive, amen, the traditions and the generation of the Levites. We worship God. His name is Jehovah. We praise Him. Mom, you have a spiritual legacy to pass down. Amen. I, I know my mother, when you look at me, say, oh, all I gave him was potato chips. No. My mom instructed me. She pushed me. Amen. I was in the 4 H club. Mm hmm. I was into training dogs. You believe that? Amen. That's what I did at the 4 H club. Amen. I was a speaker. They pushed me into speaking. My mom encouraged me with that. You got to go do that. What little money they had, they put it toward that club so I could go in and, and share. And I'd have little clip cards, and I would read on them. And it's funny. Now that see, I'm 61 years old, and I re review back in my mind that there was a day I preached about dogs. Amen. Turn that around, and it's G-O-D. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. I just had it backwards at the time. That's all. Hallelujah. She defies a danger. Verse 2 says, and she became pregnant, gave birth to a son. Wow. Imagine the stress and wondering what was going to happen when that baby was born. She realized she had a boy, and she knew the law, what the law said. The law said all little babies are thrown in the Nile for the crocodiles to eat them. She defied Pharaoh's system, that order to drown all Hebrew male babies. It was a dangerous act of civil disobedience. Here we are in 2022, the biggest news in our nation is that somebody leaked that Roe v. Wade may be overturned after 50 years that we would have the ability to save babies. And I, I sit here with a, uh, I'm bothered. I hate the fact that we got to have a law. It says babies are worth keeping. I'm sad that we got to have a law, an edict that says you can murder your baby if you want to. This should not be a law either way. This should be a heart issue. Many years ago, I went to jail, as you know, for protesting against abortion. When I got out of jail, there was a young Hispanic girl in our youth group, and she wore big black shirts, and uh, she came to me. After I got out of jail, and she said, they called me Brother Jerry then. Brother Jerry, I want you to know I'm pregnant, and I was going to abort this baby before I met you. And now I'm confused. 
I realized this is, I feel it moving. I know there's a baby in here. She said, would you adopt this baby? And I said, absolutely. We'll take adoption. We'll take this child. And then, of course, what happened was later on, her mother and her decided they would keep the child. And I met that child as a teenager. And I looked and I thought to myself, it was a heart issue that changed all this. Amen. I hate the fact that we got to have a law. I hate the fact. I hate, but since the beginning of time, there's always been this evil. And listen to me. Listen to me. This ain't about Republican and Democrat. Amen. This is about evil. Amen. And if there's a side that's evil and you want to attack, not all Democrats are evil. Not all Republicans are good. Amen. So we sit here in the middle where there's a heart here where people say, and I, and I hear it. It sounds so, when you have common sense, you mess everybody up. Can I get an amen? Amen. Because they, they, they'll say, they say stuff like this. Look, take your hands in my body, my choice. Okay? Don't, don't you touch it. If I want to kill the baby, I kill the baby. And then we come into this pandemic, and they, and they tell us, you got to get vaccinated. Because if you don't get vaccinated, you might kill something that's innocent. Excuse me? So if I don't get vaccinated, I may kill an innocent person, but it's, so it's not my body, my choice. Are you, are you following me? Can you wrap your head around it? You're figuring this thing out? So we're living in a time of much confusion on both sides. But Moses, his mother decided, her heart issue, amen, was, you know what? I'm going to defy Pharaoh's edict. I'm going to defy, I'm going to keep this baby. And, and I, the crocodiles may eat him at three months, but I had him for three months. Amen. I was blessed with this baby for three months. Glory to God. That was my baby. And now I get to nurse him. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Here, you take this one, and you can have this one, and then you can have this one. And she raised him up, and she taught him about, uh, and don't forget, don't forget, Aaron Ram's involved here. Daddy gets to come in and hold the baby. Daddy gets to talk to the baby. Daddy gets to teach the baby. Lift your hands and give him praise, son. Amen. And they, they brought him up as long as they could. And then eventually, they gave him over for adoption. She nurtured that nature in him. Amen. She blessed him. She take this baby, nurse him. Amen. She brought him up. She loved him. It's his, his formative years. Everything about you took place in your formative years. They will tell you don't even remember it. You don't even remember it. But when you were young, you were taught to be scared of stuff. When you were young, you were taught to be uh, not afraid. When you were young, you were taught to dance. When you were young, you were taught to talk more. When you were young, you were told to shut up. Amen. It was when you, you don't even remember it. But in your formative years, when your mother and your father brought you up, they were molding you. They, they were helping you. That's why as you got older, you might have backslid and run away from God, but something told you deep down inside. There's a God that loves you. There's a Jesus that sacrificed for you. And all of a sudden, you found yourself drifting back into the house of God. Why is all that? Because in your formative years... Somebody loved you enough to tell you about Jesus. Amen. Somebody brought you to a Sunday school. Somebody brought you to an ark so you could go see the, the beautiful things of God in Kentucky. Hallelujah. That took place thousands of years ago. Somebody did that for you when you were young. That's why we don't back off from kids' camp. We don't back off from our children's ministry. It's in their formative years. Hey, I thank God for our youth pastors. They get the rebellion. They get the kids aggravated. Amen. But they, the, those mamas back there and those daddies that take care of the little kids, oh, they love them little kids. Little kids are so fun. Amen. But when you get older and you get hair in your arms, that's when you're a pain. Amen. Well, thank God we got folks that take care of you then too. Can I get an amen? So, so, she, so, so she nurtured him. She looked after him. Amen. Mom, mom, the destiny, the destiny of your children is going to be, be determined by their character and who they are. I'm going to tell you, the Exodus chapter 2, verse 11, time passed. Moses grew up. You knew it was going to happen. You keep feeding them, they grow. One day he went and saw his brother, saw, and he saw all that hard labor. When he saw an Egyptian hit a Hebrew, one of the relatives, he looked his way. And then that, when he realized there was no one in sight, he killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. When I read that, I thought to myself, as Moses got older, he started figuring out who his relatives were. It, it wasn't just another Israelite. 
it was maybe a, a cousin, an uncle, somebody. And when he saw it, something rose up inside him. And he, and he kills, and of course, he runs off. You know the story of Moses. He's 80 years old when God calls him back. That's why I say for 320 years, they were slavery. Now there's 400 years of slavery. Amen. And Moses, the deliverer, comes back, amen, to deliver the people. I got to keep moving here. But she, the sacrifice she suffered. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. Ooh, how hard surrender must be. Say relinquish. Say it again. Say relinquish. See, this word right here I, is one of the most powerful words I've ever heard when it comes to letting go of something. And as believers, we struggle letting go of things. When a spouse dies, when a, when, when a child passes, when, when something that leaves our life, we have a hard time relinquishing. It literally means to let go and to let God. Let God have them. Amen. Let the Father have, and you let it go. And when she got to a place, she had to make a decision. Was it Amram that it, it counseled her? Was it Miriam that came back and said, Mama, remember, this is not your baby anymore. Amen. You're going to have to deliver. you got to let him go. And what happened when she released him, then he becomes the prince of Egypt, literally, as one of the adoption children of the Pharaoh. And he comes up that way, and it was, it was the providence again. It's the hand of God that's, being, uh, that's unseen that shows Moses coming up, and then, of course, the death of, a, of an Egyptian and him going out into the, uh, he's 40 at this time, and for 40 years he stays out in, in the desert. He works for a, 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 his father-in-law for 40 years, and then he comes back. So it's an amazing story. But getting back to Jochebed, you need to grab hold of this principle that your children, everything you've got is a privilege and not your possession. We are so possessive-minded, we want to hang on to, amen, I, after two floods that took almost everything out of my home, amen, that I, even my vehicles and my scooters took my horse out, took one of my dogs out, amen, I have learned the power of relinquish because I found that God keeps bringing it back into your life, amen. He keeps, re, uh, you, you struggle. You will struggle faith-wise for a moment. You will struggle emotionally. You will struggle with why God, amen. But when you decide to back off and say, Lord, it ain't why. It's what can I learn through this? What is it you're teaching me? I got to trust you when I can't trace, when I can't figure it out. I'm going to trust you right now. That's what takes place. And she had to let him go. And as a father of three adopted children, I thank God for the mothers. They decided it was better to release them children in the arms of somebody else than to have them sacrificed. Let me just tell you, it, to, to have them destroyed, killed, mutilated, uh, all you got to do is look it up if you've been afraid to. Look it up and see what an abortion does. Amen. And so I've been blessed on that, privileged. And there have been times in my life when I looked at them kids and I thought to myself, Lord Jesus, did you really say they were privileged? Can I get an Amen. There's a time they're going to stretch you just a little bit. Can I get an amen? They're going to pull on you just a little. But how hard? You know, again, and again, I say it, privilege, not possession. Biggest lesson I ever learned as a parent was that's my privilege. When they're doing wrong, steal my privilege. When they're heartache, they steal my privilege. Amen. And even at a young age, Moses' mom began to release him into God's grand design. God had a plan for that boy. In order to be a deliverer of the Jews from Egypt, this was the route God prescribed for Moses to go. Without her sacrifice, there would have been no deliverance for God's people. Mom, you're training up a deliverer. You have no idea what your child's going to be like. You, you don't know, so you do the best you can to train them. You're training up a messenger, amen, a servant for the king. Some moms, amen, when they give their child up, I believe they have to believe it's for the best. And when she released that child, you know, I was talking to my pastor right here. That's it. We don't hear anything else about Jochebed and Amram. It's over. But they did their part. Sometimes you think, well, there's more for me to do. No, you did your part. Amen. You did what you were called to do. Hallelujah. Some moms, they sacrifice careers. They give up their dreams for the freedom of their children. Whew. I've, I've met moms who thought, you know what? I, I gave this up, this up, this up, just so I could be with that kid. Or maybe small privileges like a full night's sleep. <laughs> right, Tony? A hot meal. 
the luxury of time alone. Charles Finney. Is it Charles? Uh, Wesley. Charles Wesley. John Wesley. Charles wrote songs. John was a preacher. Come from a large family. I'm, I'm throwing at you about 10, 11 kids. They said their mama always kept an apron on because she was always cooking. But every now and then, mama would sit down, and she'd put her head down and throw her apron over her head. Well, mama threw her apron over her head. That told the kids, don't you ask me anything. Don't you say nothing to me. I will beat you to an inch of your life. This is my time. She'd sit down and throw that apron over her head. Mama, sometimes you got to get an apron. And you got to teach your kids, I need a little time for myself. Amen. I just got to have a little time. And then she reaps a reward. She, name was Moses. Jochebed's son became one of the greatest men who ever lived. The Scripture says of him in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24, we're going to New Testament now. By faith, Moses, when he'd grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I'm Jochebed's son. That is Amram. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather to enjoy all the pleasures of sin. One scripture says for a season. Sin is just a season. I often said, Steve, it's sin. The season of sin lasts somewhere between age 16 and 24. Pastor, why you say that? Because that's long enough time for you to screw everything up that takes the rest of your life to fix. <laughs> Amen. He said, I'd, I'd rather be with the children of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. No one, watch this. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ. There's, there's Jesus. Well, Moses, how do you know anything about Jesus? He had to have a revelation. Amen. He had to grasp hold of something that God was into sons here. And there's a son named Jesus as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Those who have gone on before us went into a reward. What we do here matters there. That reward. Mama, grandma, guardians. You don't realize the reward God has for you, what it's going to be like. I know we'll be known as we're known. We're going to connect. All those things are going to be wonderful. But there's something about looking ahead and realizing this is not all there is. Our kids may not achieve the degree of greatness as a Moses, but I believe they can be used to God. And what a gift to give mom, but to have a heart toward God, to be responsible adults, productive members of our nation to be a loving spouse, to repeat the traits handed down to you. That mama, she handed down a heritage. She defied a danger. She nurtured her nature. She sacrificed, and she reaped a reward. Proverbs 31 says of her, her children rise and call her blessed. Mom, believe in your influence. Believe in your influence. Amen. You got influence over your children. Amen. Hallelujah. It's not all about us. It's about reaching our kids. As a dad, I, I remind myself, I know I have influence. God help me in Jesus' name. Some of you mamas have had to be daddy too. God love you. You had to be daddy too. Some of you grandparents have been raising your own children, grandchildren again. God love you. But no matter how this turns out, keep loving God. Keep loving God. And if God brings a child into your life, that's a privilege. That's a privilege. Not everybody gets this privilege. Amen. Then love, God will put love in your heart. Ooh. He'll put love in your heart for a child that you didn't think you could love. He'll put, he'll put it right inside you, and you'll be a defender of that child. You'll care for that child. Amen. When that child does wrong, you'll stand for that child. That child will remember you when they get older. Heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment. Father, in Jesus' name, you are a mender of hearts. You also a giver of joy. You have given us so much joy on this planet, 
and then told us that later we're still going to get a reward. So I pray over every mom in this house that you touch their heart, presence of God. Touch their heart. Knit their heart together again. <laughs> Help us remember the good times, the good memories. <sighs> Blowing on a scraped knee. <sighs> Putting that Band-Aid on. Making everything better. Laying with them at night. Kissing their tears away. Letting them know the storm was just God walking around in heaven. <laughs> we make up all kinds of stories to make our kids feel good. Lord, we bless you in this house. We thank you for the mamas. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give God one more praise in here. Everybody say, Jacobed. Thank God for Jacobed. Amen. When you look at the mamas in the Bible, look, at, look for them. Mamas are there. Every great child that was brought up had a mom. Noah, David, David loved his mama. Amen. Just keep looking through the Scripture. You'll see mama over and over again. you see Mary, the mother of Jesus. He's 33. She's at the cross. You know, one of the things that hit me about the seven sayings of the cross was this. Only one disciple was there out of all of them. Sometimes your worst time seemed like only one showed up. But thank God for the one. Amen? Amen. If you need to tie the offered envelope, it is in front of you. It is in front of you. Amen. I'm going to give you, we're going to take a tithe and offer it up. Then we're going to do the rest of this. So if I get a couple of servant leaders to come up and grab a bucket for me, help me out. To those giving online, I thank you for stepping up. Man, that, that giving online has gone up. Again, I don't understand it. I've never done it. Um, I, I probably will never buy an electric car. I uh, may never do this, but those of you that are doing it, thank you. Amen. You know, how, you know finance is better than I do. Uh, David, I'll take it from here. If you get those roses for me, amen. As we give today, we're believing God for more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. A couple of announcements as we're going through the week. Don't forget Tuesday night prayer meeting here.